Well, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to preach. I cherish it every time I, I, get, uh, I get tapped. Uh, and so, um, you know, when I, when I open God's Word, I, there's always a little bit of uh, fearfulness uh, because I, I want to communicate so well. Uh, I, want, I want God's Word open before you. Um, the good news is that, is that it's God's Word that possesses authority um, and not mine. And so my goal is to tell you what God's Word says. Um, so we're going to start with a question this morning, that uh, little rocky start to your, to your morning, but we're just going hit, to hit you with it. What is your worst nightmare? <laughs> good morning. <laughs> what is your worst nightmare? This week I asked some of the staff, and I won't throw any of them under the bus and tell you who said what, but uh, you know, looking at it a couple of different ways, it could be a dream that you, like a recurring dream that you have, or it could be, uh, it could be just simply one of your worst fears. Uh, somebody said drowning, somebody said falling, somebody said fire, a couple of people said something happening to their kids, that's, of course, probably most people. What's my worst nightmare? I have these two recurring dreams. I'm going to tell you about I'm hesitating a little bit to tell you because I know afterwards some of you are going to come try to analyze them for me. Please, please don't because I don't care. <laughs> uh, but I have these two recurring dreams that have come on for a long time, multiple times. Multiple times uh, in, in a year I'll get these dreams, and they both are kind of the same thing, just two different angles. One of them is I'm about to have a gig. I'm about to play a show at this big arena, and there's a band. I don't know my band. I don't know who they are. It's like a faceless thing. Um, but I'm late, and I show up, and they're ready to start, and I'm not ready, and I'm trying to plug my stuff in and get going, and, but everybody's waiting on me. And then the other dream is kind of like it. it I, I'm in a high school play. I was in, I was in high school theater, by the way, um, and, and so I was in this, I'm in this play and this dream, and uh, the curtains are closed. I'm in, I'm in costume. Everybody's ready to go, but I don't know my lines. And I've got a script in my hand, and the dream is me trying to find a place to stash it so that I can kind of read my lines as we go, uh, and then the curtains are about to open. That, that is these, these two nightmares that I have. Please don't analyze them. I, don't judge me. Um, so uh, what, what is your worst nightmare? Well, uh, this morning, uh, we're, we're going to look at a situation where there's a group of people who are experiencing their worst nightmare. You can turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 33. It's in this chapter that we're going to find that God keeps his promises to his people even in the midst of great peril. We're going to begin reading in verses 4 and 5 and We're going to find the peril of the people, the peril of God's people. Jeremiah chapter 33, beginning in verse 4, says this, For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounds and against the sword. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans. And to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from this city because of all of their evil. In these verses we find an allusion to the peril of God's people. In order for us to understand what's going on in verses 4 and 5, we need a little bit of background information. We need to kind of rewind a little bit and see what's going on. God says that these things are taking place because of all of their evil. What was the evil that was taking place? Let me frame this for you. The the people of Judah, the people that are being spoken of in this text, are God's chosen people. God has chosen them from among the nations, and he has given them land. He has given them blessing in this land. And they are God's people walking in his promises. And then God gives them a king. Their first real legitimate king is King David. And then after David, there's king after king after king. David's descendants, his son, his grandson, and and so forth. David's descendants are the kings. 
of Judah. But things start to deteriorate after a while. Not every king is a good king. As a matter of fact, there are some kings that are bad kings. Kings were like uh, spiritual leaders for the people. So if the king was good and followed after the Lord, then the people followed after the Lord. But if the kings were bad, the people were bad, and they walked in sin. And so the, the people kind of did what the king did. And so there was a good king, and there was a bad king, and there was a good king and a bad king. And it kind of had this rhythm for a while of good kings and bad kings. And then it all kind of culminates, and it, and it unravels under one king. His name was Manasseh. God says Manasseh is the worst king that Judah ever had. Because he didn't trust the Lord, he had an alliance with the Assyrians. And this alliance, he was more of a vassal to the Assyrians. And so what that meant was that the Assyrians kind of imposed uh, their spiritual ideas on Judah. What that meant practically was they set up idols in the temple of God. In the place where the one true God was supposed to be worshipped. In the place where God had placed his very presence. Other gods were being worshipped through idols. They worshipped Baal, the Canaanite god. They worshipped Moloch. The way that you, one of the ways that you worshipped Moloch was through child sacrifice. And so God's chosen people are worshiping some other God by killing their own children. How heinous can it get? And God says in, this te- in the Bible, God, God says that because of what Manasseh has done, because of what he has allowed to take place, because of what the people under his reign have done, I'm going to bring horror and death and destruction and exile on Judah. The people who are called by the name of God are going to experience one of the worst things you could probably imagine. This is because of Manasseh the king. Well, of course, there's another king after Manasseh. Eventually, it's Josiah, and he's a good king, and he has all of these reforms, but none of it lasts. It's all, it all kind of appears to be superficial because as soon as Josiah dies, they just go back to doing what they had done before, maybe even worse. But now it's not Assyria that they have this relationship with. Now it's Babylon. Babylon is the big bad nation, and they have this vassal relationship with them. And the last king of Judah is one of David's descendants named Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the last king of Judah. He is kind of a vassal to Babylon. That means whatever they say, I do. Well, Zedekiah decides that He doesn't want to do that anymore. He plans to rebel. In this book that we're reading, Jeremiah, in this book, Jeremiah tells King Zedekiah, he says, you would be better off to surrender. Babylon is going to come get you, and it would be better off that you just surrender. Because if you don't, we're all going to die. That's what Jeremiah tells Zedekiah, but the king doesn't listen, and he plans a revolt against Babylon. And when he does, Babylon responds with fury, and they show up in full force. And by 588 B.C., Jerusalem was under siege by the Babylonians. Nobody in, nobody out. That's all kind of the framework. That's the lead up to what we found in verses 4 and 5. The Babylonians are at the gate, and here's what's taking place. In verse 4, it tells us something terrible. It tells us that they're ripping down the houses in Jerusalem. And they're taking that rubble, and they're using it to barricade and to fortify the walls around the city. And not only houses, it says the houses of the kings. Those are palaces. Beautiful palaces are being ripped down. And they're using this rubble to fortify themselves against the Babylonians who have them surrounded. But verse 5 gets even worse. See, in verse 5, it tells us that the people who died during this siege, the people who were, who were killed during the siege, what, during this time period, that the people were using their bodies to fortify the walls. 
I'm not sure it gets much worse than that. And the Bible says also in verse 5 of chapter 33 that God hid his face from them. God removed his favor from them. It's almost as if God couldn't bear to watch what was happening and what was about to happen, so he looked away. I can't even watch what's about to take place. God hid his face. The Babylonians are at the gate. They are done. They are done playing with Judah. They will tolerate no more rebellion from them. There's going to be death. There's going to be destruction. The Babylonians had done this all over the world, and Judah was going to be no different. And that's what the book of Jeremiah is all about. And Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. It's because if you were to sit down and read the book of Jeremiah, it's just so sad. He is, he is despairing. He is distraught because of what his people have done and because of what's about to be done to them. As a matter of fact, I want to read to you uh, in chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, listen to Jeremiah's heart. He says, My joy is gone. Grief is upon me. My heart is sick within me. Behold, the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and the breadth of the land. And they ask the question, the people ask the question, Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? And the Lord responds to them, Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their foreign idols? And the people respond, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And so then Jeremiah offers his commentary, For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. I mourn. And dismay has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of the daughter of my people not been restored? Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. The despair the dismay. The book that follows Jeremiah is called Lamentations. That's Jeremiah's book also. It's a book of laments. It's just so sad. Jeremiah said in that text, he is heartsick over the sin, the impending doom that is coming upon his people. He says, for the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wounded. My heart is wounded because of the heart wound of my people. And he asked the question, is there no balm in Gilead? Like, is there no medicine to heal what's plaguing these people? Is there no physician? Is there nobody that can bring healing? You hear the anguish of Jeremiah. Things could not have been worse. And I think the question that I'm asking you this morning then is, have you ever been there? And maybe some of you are walking there now. Have you ever experienced a situation where you felt like the enemy was at the gate? Like, if one more bad thing happens, I think I'm going to fall apart. Have you experienced like, it's like you, you open the door, your front door, and you're standing on your porch, and there's like floodwaters there, you know? And it just takes just a little bit more, and that water's going to be inside my house. Maybe you've experienced this kind of feeling in a relationship, maybe a marriage relationship. Maybe you have experienced this sort of thing financially, and something has happened, and you're just not sure how you're going to make it. Maybe, maybe you've experienced this situation with your kids. They've done something, or something has happened to them, and, and you're just, you just don't know if you can take it anymore. Or, or maybe it's another family member, or maybe something with your physical health, or maybe something with your mental health. And it feels like the enemies are at the gate. Or maybe you're dealing with something that's a result of your own choices. You kind of brought it on yourself, but you're not sure how much more you can take of it. Have you ever felt this kind of despair? If I did my math right, 
184 years ago today, the Mexican army under Santa Ana showed up in San Antonio. And the Texan soldiers hustled into the Alamo where they found themselves surrounded and outnumbered. The Mexican army was there to put down the Texas Revolution. Well, the commander of the Texan forces in the Alamo was William Barrett Travis, and on February 24th, which would be tomorrow, he wrote this letter. He wrote, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours, and I've not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. Well, I have answered that demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty and of patriotism and everything dear to American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. And he finishes with victory or death. Now, there's a couple of things that I want you to notice from that letter. I mean, of course, the bravery, a man who is asking for reinforcements that are not going to come, a man willing to stand up for what he believes and to give his life for what he believes. But my question is, have you ever felt besieged by an enemy that's too big for you? Have you ever felt surrounded on every side? No way of escape. Constant bombardment. And you might be saying, I'm still standing. I'm not sure how much longer I can still stand, but here I am. The enemy had offered no quarter. That means you can surrender if you want, but everyone's going to die. And this is what Jeremiah had prophesied would happen to Judah. This is their worst nightmare. It was all going to come to an end, and there was nothing anyone could do to stop it. This is the peril of the people of God. But what we find in this text is in the midst of the peril of the people of God, God reminds his people of his promises. This is actually the way that the book, the entire book of Jeremiah is organized. The whole thing is about what God is about to do to his own people. But in the middle of the book, just kind of tucked in there, is something that's different. As a matter of fact, these chapters are so different that some scholars think Jeremiah didn't even write it. Now, they're wrong. He did write them. But that's how different they are. It looks like somebody else wrote it. These chapters are known as the book of consolation, the book of hope. And right in the middle of all of the despair, there is hope. There is a fire of hope in the sea of despair. As Tolkien once wrote, often hope is born when all is forlorn. In the middle of despair, when the Babylonians are at the gate, what does God have to say to his people Remember my promises. Look with me in Jeremiah 33 in verse 14 where we're going to see the promises of God. Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. 
And the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. In the midst of peril, God reminds the people of his promises. When we read this text, there are really three promises that I see in this text that God makes to Judah. The first one is found in verse 16. He promises that there will be peace. Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. The second promise that God makes is in verse 17 where he promises a king. He says, David will never lack a man on the throne. What that means, back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David, you are king right now and one of your sons will always be king. That that will be the way that it goes. He made this promise to David and he is reminding the people, David will never lack a man on the throne. There will always be a Davidic king. The third promise he makes is in verse 18. He promises a priest. God promises that there will always be a priest to make sacrifices before the Lord. So we see these promises here, peace, a king, a priest, and then God kind of doubles down in verses 19 through 21. He doubles down and he talks about the permanence of these promises. God says, I've made a covenant with night and day. When God created the idea of night and day, the covenant is you show up at the same time every time, night and day. There's always gonna be night, there's always gonna be day. God says, I've made this covenant with night and day. When that covenant ends, my covenant about David and about the priest, that covenant will end. In other words, as long as there's night and day, these promises hold true. These promises are permanent, God says. These promises are permanent, but there is a problem with these promises. There is a problem with these promises. The Babylonians are at the gate still. While Jeremiah is writing this down, the Babylonians are at the gate. Trouble is on the way. You might be tempted to think because you watch too many movies that after God makes this promise that now the Babylonians go away. And that actually had happened before. Hezekiah was one of David's descendants. He was king. And this time the Assyrians had them surrounded. And Hezekiah called out to the Lord. And he prayed to the Lord. And and what the Lord did is he killed tens of thousands of Assyrians and they fled. God delivered the people of Judah from their siege. And you might be tempted to think he's going to do it again. But not this time. There would be no deliverance for Judah. After one year of siege, the walls of the city were breached just as the supply of food ran out. The Babylonians burned the city. They broke down its walls. They rounded up the priests. They rounded up the military. They rounded up state officials. They rounded up the citizens. Some of them were executed. Some of them were exiled. And King Zedekiah, he made a run for it. He took a contingency of soldiers and he took his family and he ran the other direction. But the Babylonians caught up with King Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho and he captured them. They brought Zedekiah before Nebuchadnezzar and before Nebuchadnezzar, they brought Zedekiah's sons. And the last thing Zedekiah saw was they killed all of his sons and then they gouged out his eyes. The last thing he saw was the death of his sons and then they took Zedekiah back to Babylon in chains where he would live the remainder of his days. After Zedekiah, there was no Davidic king. Not only that, there was no temple. They The Babylonians came in and they knocked down the temple. They took anything of value and they knocked it down completely. There was nothing left. There was no temple. There were no priests. There was no way to make a sacrifice before the Lord. Now now the Jews would return and they would rebuild the temple and then King Herod, uh, Herod the Great would actually help rebuild the temple that Jesus saw. But in 70 AD, the Romans came through and they 
knock that down also. There was no temple. There were no sacrifices to be offered. Had God failed to keep his promise? There's no king. There's no priest. There's no sacrifices. Did God fail? Let me tell you a secret. God doesn't think like us. God doesn't do things the way that we would expect him to do. And God isn't afraid of the long way around. When my son was four years old, uh, he didn't like school. He still kind of doesn't like school. Uh, But he didn't really like school. We started him at preschool. And so to try to make it better, we started a tradition where every Friday when I picked him up from school, we would go to Sonic. Not, you know, before Fridays were for grilling, Fridays were for Sonic. Uh, and we would go to Sonic every Friday. Well, one day I went to go pick him up, and I noticed that there was some construction on one of the main roads in Seguin. That's where we lived. And they, uh, they had kind of traffic was down to one lane, and they were doing this alternating thing, and it was going to just be a headache getting back. And so I went to go pick my son up. He got in the car, and I drove down Court Street. But instead of driving down Court Street and taking a left on King Street, I actually went down Court Street and then turned into a neighborhood. And when I did that, I could see my son starting to process what was taking place. He's very observant. And what he used to do is when he was thinking, he had this move he would do. When he was thinking, he would look in one place, but he would turn his head side to side kind of like this. And so I I would look in the rearview mirror. I looked in the rearview mirror, and I saw him thinking. And then he asked the question, Dad, where are we going? And I said, we're going to Sonic. And here comes the processing again. And then he thought, and he said out loud, no, we're not. And I, at this point, I'm kind of amused Yes, we are. We're going to Sonic. And, you know, I'm taking a left turn, taking a right turn, kind of weaving through this neighborhood. He says, but this isn't the way to go to Sonic. This isn't it. And we kind of had this back and forth the whole way there. Do you know when my son really believed that we were going to Sonic, you know when he came to that conclusion is when we rolled up the backside of Sonic. That's when he realized dad knew where he was going. He who has an ear, let him hear. See, there's a reason why we took the long way around. My son wasn't privy to that information. And he didn't exactly trust that I knew where I was going, but the whole time I knew where I was going. God is not afraid of the long way around. Had God failed to keep his promises? No. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. There's going to be another branch off of the branch of David. David is like a branch. There's going to be a branch off of David, but it's going to be a righteous branch. One day there was going to be a king that would come that would execute justice and righteousness. The line of David would be preserved. It would be preserved into exile, into Babylon. It would be preserved on its way back into Judah. It would be preserved for hundreds of years. It would be this line would thrive and continue, and then one day a Davidic king would be born. And he wouldn't be born in the way that most people expected. There were no trumpets for the birth of this king. There was no palace for the birth of this king. The nation didn't gather together to celebrate. It was a baby in a manger. His mother named him Jesus, son of Mary, son of David, son of God. And this king reigns forever in the line of David. But he doesn't just reign over Judah. 
He reigns over all things. He is sovereign over all things. He is the first. He is the last. And he is sovereign over everything in between. He is the alpha. He is the omega. God keeps his promises in the person of Jesus Christ. And God not only promised a king forever in the line of David. He promised a priest to offer sacrifices. Well, what is a priest? A priest is, is someone who kind of stands between God and man. He's a representative of the people to God, and he kind of represents God to the people. And he goes before God, and he brings offerings And burnt sacrifices to atone for the sin of the people. But there was no temple. You read in the Gospels. Jesus says, if you tear this temple down, it'll be raised up in three days. He was talking about his body. Jesus is not only the temple, Jesus is the priest. He is the one who stands between God and man. He is the one who fills the gap. He is the one who has offered a sacrifice, but it's not the blood of goats and sheep. It's his very own blood that he offered as a sacrifice so that you and I might find the cleansing and the forgiveness of sin that we need. Jesus stands between God and man. He ever lives to plead for you and me. He is the priest who offers us access to the throne room of God. Jesus is priest forever. God keeps his promises in the person of Jesus Christ. He may take the long way around, but he keeps his promises. He may do things the hard way, but he keeps his promises. So what does all this mean for us this morning? Three different things. One, the people of God will experience peril. There are some people in our society who lie to us. And they make us believe that if we follow after Jesus, then everything should go well in my life. And so that when bad things happen to us, we're tempted to think, That maybe God doesn't love me or maybe I've done something wrong to deserve this. Well, that just isn't the case. The Apostle Paul explains to us that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You will experience peril in your life because of Jesus. And Peter says something like it. He he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to test you as if something strange were happening to you. You should come to expect difficulty. The people of God will experience peril. But the second thing that I find from this text is that God is a promise maker. God promised peace. God promised a king. God promised a priest. What promises has God made to you and me? He's promised us things like this. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God and God will give it without reproach. He's promised this. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And and he's promised us that all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And I just rattled that off my tongue and I don't think you believe me. Did you hear what I said? That all things, not some things, all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. To his purpose. God is a promise maker, and the good news for us this morning is not just that God is a promise maker, it's the third thing that I see in this text is that God is a promise keeper. He makes promises, he keeps those promises. He makes promises, 
and he keeps promises. He's not like us. See, you, you and I, we make promises and we break them. We even make big promises. We call them covenants and we break those too. But not God. He means what he says and he does what he says he will do. But he doesn't do things the way we think he should all the time. He's got his own way of doing things. He's got his own timing for things. See, the hard way is God's preferred method of carrying out his purposes. And I think the reason why is because if everything was easy, we would start to learn to trust in ourselves. And that's the reason why it's hard to have faith, because God likes the hard way. When, when things aren't easy, it's hard for us to cling to the scriptures. When the enemy is at the gate, whether it's finances or relationships or physical health or something going on at work, or maybe it's the, the struggle, your temptation with sin, maybe it's that, and that's the enemy at the gate. It's, it's hard to hold on to the promises of God. One time, there, there was a man living his worst nightmare. A man living his worst nightmare. Something was wrong with his kid. If you're a parent, I'm sure you know that feeling. Something's wrong with my kid and I'm helpless. Well, what was wrong with this particular kid was that he was possessed by a demon. And so the father brings his son to the disciples. And, and the disciples... They can't do anything about it, so they bring this kid to Jesus. And the man says to Jesus, if, if you can do anything about this, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus responds, he says, what do you mean if I can? What, what is it that you mean when you say if I can? All things are possible for the one who believes. And the man responds in the most honest way you could possibly respond. He doesn't give the church answer. He says, well, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but I, I kind of don't. I wonder if that's anybody in the room this morning. I believe that Jesus can deliver me from my circumstances. I believe that all things are gonna work for good. Like, I believe that, but on another level, I'm not so sure. Have you seen what I'm dealing with? Have you seen the, the enemy that's at my gate? I'm not so sure I'm gonna be able to deal with this, and I'm not sure that God's gonna come through. How can God bring beauty from these ashes? And we resonate, we resonate with this man, I believe, help my unbelief. I'm not sure what your worst nightmare is. But the disciples experienced their worst nightmare. They had hitched themselves. They had given their entire lives to follow Jesus. And when Jesus marched into Jerusalem, they thought he was marching in to be crowned king. They thought Jeremiah 33 was happening before their eyes. And Jesus rode, on, rode into Jerusalem. They thought that's what was going to happen, but then their worst nightmare was realized when they arrested him and they tried him and they convicted him and they tortured him and they brutally executed him on the cross. They put him in a grave. They had hitched themselves to this man and now he was dead. That was their worst nightmare. But God's ways are not our ways. God doesn't always do things the way that we wish he would. He likes to do things the hard way. He likes to go the long way around. And for Jesus, the hard way was that he had to die. And all seemed lost, but it wasn't. God had a plan. And nobody really understood that plan. Everyone's looking around stunned. How can this be? God didn't come through. And three days later, Jesus burst from the tomb. He rolled the stone away. And he defeated death. The enemies were at the gate. All seemed lost, but that was on Friday we were waiting on a Sunday comeback. Jesus had to go to the grave for death to die. 
And then you and me, we look at that and we wonder about God's promises. If God did not withhold his son from me, if God did not spare his son for me, is he going to hold back on these promises? Will he not also freely give me all things? If God gave me his most precious possession, his son, why would he withhold anything else from me? All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Oh, but you don't know my circumstances. You don't know how messy things are. You, you don't know how terrible things are. And you don't know what I did to get there. Like, I kind of deserve this. I did these things, and now I'm, I'm reaping what I have sown. You don't know how messed up things are. You don't know my ashes. How can you say God will keep this promise to me? How can all things work for my good? You're right. I have no idea. Like, I only know some things. But there's so much going on at this church. There are so many places where your heart is wounded. And it's things you've done. It's things that's been done to you. It's life circumstances. Your heart is wounded. And I echo, I echo uh, Jeremiah in chapter 8 when he said, For the sin of my people, my heart is wounded. For the wounding of my people, my heart is wounded. I'm, I'm with Jeremiah there. Of only the things that I know that go on at this church, my heart is wounded. Because of your brokenness, I am broken. So I can agree with Jeremiah there, but I cannot agree with Jeremiah. There, there's, there's a question that he asked. Do you remember it? I can't, I can't ask that question. Is there a balm in Gilead? I I'm not going to ask that question this morning. Do you know why I'm not going to ask that question? It's because I already know the answer. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. There is a balm in Gilead. His name is Jesus. And this morning, I'm asking you. I'm asking you this morning. I want you to turn to the Lord Jesus. Some of you have never turned to him for the first time. You've never submitted yourself to his lordship. You've never taken advantage of the blood of his cross for forgiveness of sins. You've never trusted in him for eternal life that's made possible by his resurrection from the dead. You've never never submitted yourself to the Lord Jesus this morning, and I'm telling you, submit to the Lord Jesus. Turn to him this morning. But there's... Probably more of you in this room who are living your worst nightmare. And I'm telling you, turn to the Lord Jesus. Turn to him in the middle of it. Stop trying to fight alone. Stop running from the Lord because things aren't going the way you think they should. Turn to the Lord Jesus. He is a promise maker. He is a promise keeper. Turn to Jesus this morning. Now, in this room, don't wait till later so you can process things. Do it now. Turn to the Lord Jesus. And the way that you're going to do that, uh, in a second, elders or prayer team are going to come forward and they're going to pray. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray. Well, there's some people who can help you and they can pray for you. Or you may just stay at your chair when the band comes to sing. Uh, You may just stay there and you may need to process right then during the song. Don't sing. Just process and pray. But I'm asking you, stop turning away from Jesus. Turn toward him. Turn to Jesus. Bring him your nightmare. Bring him your pride. Bring him your selfishness. Bring him your unforgiveness. Bring bring him those temptations that you, you just can't seem to beat. Bring it to the Lord Jesus this morning. Thank you.